Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Harry Belafonte. There you are, sir. <laughs> How about that? I introduced you twice. <laughs> Thank you. Before I engage my official responsibilities, I just have an observation to make, and that I hope the young lady who spoke up about injustice and the overwhelming uh, number of young black men that languish in the prisons of America is not uh, deterred from her point of view or the work she wants to do. Uh, and I would like to just make sure that Andy's point of view was not completely misrepresented. Uh, as long as I've known Andy and I've known him forever, he's always been trying to make capitalism smell like roses. <laughs> and I think we're running out of perfume. And I think that from the perspective of the young lady on the whole issue of what's missing, she's more on target than we are. And I've spent a great deal of time and investment emotionally and intellectually and politically in the affairs of the young people down in Ferguson, Missouri. I've just come back from there where we had a long three-day retreat discussing the effective application of nonviolence and the threat of violence. And although I think young people are wrestling tenaciously with that issue in, among themselves, among members of the community, what I find appalling and I find really very much engaged with the equations that the young lady was making is that nobody has really talked honorably and honestly about the violence of state. Most of that which we are experiencing is not just the agitation that exists among some young people that are disgruntled and feel the agenda is just not moving along as rapidly as they would like, and I think they're right. But I do believe that there are those who have the power and the authority to order the power of a state to do the mischief that it does in the media, the civil rights movement, the black caucus, our religious leaders. No one stands up and speaks honorably to the great flaw in the state and how it applies its responsibilities. And while we're talking about what young people in conflict should and should not do, let us talk also about the state and what it has not done in the protection of justice and dealing with the people. Let me express my great sense of privilege and opportunity to have been invited by Andrew to participate in this evening's ceremony. My specific task is to deal with the little section that's been given us for culture. <laughs> A great leader, one of the predecessors to the organization that we have labeled civil rights, a man by the name of Paul Robeson. <clears throat> a 
and counseling a group of young black students who had aspired to a life in the theater. He had reason to tell us that we had embarked upon a noble profession, that artists are the gatekeepers of truth, was how he phrased it. Artists are the gatekeepers of truth. And that art is the radical voice of civilization. On with those rather lofty statements and ideas and thoughts, the group of young black artists walked off into the second half of the second century. Sidney Poitier, Ozzy Davis, Ruby, the list goes on and on. We were there not knowing quite where to go and what to do, except we knew we had to go and there was something we would have to do. And it turned out that much of what we did landed on the positive side of the ledger. During our time, we had to turn around a, a culture that was mostly built on the demeaning of people of color. When I was a kid and I went to the movies in the theaters of Harlem, I saw films like Birth of a Nation, which uh, demeaned us which suggested that we were a peoples of absent of culture, absent of, absent of intellect, absent of a deeper truth. We had no history, we had no background. We were bare servants of those who control the social agenda. In Birth of a Nation, we were shown at our worst as objects of brutal sexuality, bent upon raping women of European descent and using our newly found liberation from the struggles of the Civil War to be undermined by our indulgence in that which was less than honorable. And this film, upon release, turned America against itself. Race was set upon race. Cities were torched for days upon days upon days, rioting that took place all over the world, all over the country. Not too long after that, we saw films like Tarzan of the Apes. Here was this white force, this porcelain Adonis, swinging through the trees of Africa gifted with no language, who could not speak to any persons except the animals in instructions that only the animals could understand. And his task was to ensure that Africa would survive the mischief of its indigenous black population who were capable of doing absolutely nothing. And that, as a young black person sitting in the theater in Harlem, looking, found that uh, the one thing I did not want to be was an African. Because as they were depicted, as I saw them, there was no honor and no nobility. But also in the cartoons, a lot of the things that we saw at Walt Disney and others who depicted us as buffoons and minstrel instruments of nonsense, all those things came piling on us. And we were required to hunt through all those concepts to find out more about who we were. With the turn of the century and with people like Paul Robeson, artists with the gatekeepers of truth, we set upon a new order. Sidney Poitier, stepped into the world of screen and gave us an image of the black man and black people in ways that we had never quite seen them before, not in popular culture. And not too long after that, a series of films began to come out that depicted us in more favorable ways, 
yet still missing the target in dealing with the deeper substance of who we are as a people and what our history was capable of doing. I'm soon to be 88 years of age, and uh, in the <laughs> and in the face of that rather disturbing truth, <laughs> I am so honored and so rewarded that I should have lived long enough to see the emergence of a young man in the world of culture, in the world of art, to have delivered to us what is the quintessential work of art in the world of film that is absolutely without any equivocation, the finest picture dealing with a deeper and a more profound look at black life, black people, black struggle, and black power. When we were given the gift of 12 years a slave, America was rewarded by getting to see a film that was unequivocal in its display of the nakedness of the brutality of those who were pressed and of the violent experience that were had by the people who were the victims of that oppression. And it then depicted the nobility of those people themselves in overcoming that transgression. Twelve Years a Slave so captured the imagination not only of our profession, but of the minds and hearts of the people of America that it was required to receive the highest honor that be given a film by the Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences. It was nominated as the best picture of the year. And how honored and privileged I am to not only have begun to come to know Mr. Steve McQueen, but to be able to develop with him a set of exchanges and thoughts on what we could do with the future that is left to us. Mine a little shorter than his, but existent nevertheless. It gives me a great deal of honor and privilege to bestow the honor from the Andrew Goodman Foundation on Mr. Steve McQueen for 12 years a slave.